Chapter 6 The son of your mate did well, Brun. It was a good, clean kill. Zug said as the hunters eased the great beast down in front of the cave. You have a new hunter to be proud of. He showed courage and a strong arm, Brun gestured. He laid his hand on the young man's shoulder, his eyes glowing with pride. Brout basked in the warm praise. Zug and Dorv examined the mighty young bull with admiration. Tinged with nostalgia for the excitement of the chase and the thrill of success, forgetting the dangers and disappointments that were part of the arduous adventure of hunting big game. No longer able to hunt with the younger men, but not wanting to be left out, the two old men had spent the morning scouting the wooded hillsides for smaller prey. I see you and Dorv put your slings to good use. I could smell the meat cooking halfway up the hill, Brun continued. When we get settled in the new cave, we'll have to find a place to practice. The clan would benefit if all the hunters had your skill with the sling, Zug, and it won't be long before Vorn will need to be trained. The leader was aware of the contribution the older men still made to the sustenance of the clan, and wanted them to know it. The hunts were not always successful. More than once, meat was supplied by the efforts of the older men, and during the heavy snows of winter, Occasional fresh meat was often more easily brought down with a sling. It provided a welcome change from their winter diet of dried, preserved meat, especially later in the season when the frozen supplies from late fall hunts ran out. Nothing like the young bison there, but we got a few rabbits and a fat beaver. The food is ready. We've just been waiting for you, Zug motioned. I did notice a level clearing not far away that might make a good practice field. Zug, who had lived with Grodd since the death of his mate, had worked to improve his skill with the sling after he retired from the ranks of Brun's hunters. It and the bola were the most difficult weapons for the men of the clan to master. Though their muscular, heavy-boned, and slightly bowed arms were tremendously powerful, they could perform functions as delicate and precise as napping flint. The development of their arm joints, particularly the way muscles and tendons were attached to bones, gave them precise manual dexterity coupled with unbelievable strength. But there was a penalty. That same joint development restricted arm movement. They could not make a full, free-swinging arc, which limited their ability to hurl objects. Not fine control, but leverage was the price they paid for strength. Their spear was not a javelin, thrown across a distance, but rather a lance thrust at close range with great force. Training with spear or club was little more than developing powerful muscles, but learning to use a sling or a bola took years of practice and concentration. The sling a strip of flexible leather held together at both ends and whirled around the head to gain momentum before flinging the round pebble held in the bulging cup at the middle, took great effort, and Zug was proud of his ability to sling a stone accurately. He was equally proud that Brun called upon him to train young hunters in the use of that weapon. While Zug and Dorv ranged the hillsides hunting with slings, the women had foraged over the same terrain, and the tantalizing aroma of cooking food whetted the appetites of the hunters. It made them realize that hunting was hungry work. They did not have long to wait. The men relaxed after the meal, replete with satisfaction, retelling the incidents of the exciting hunt for their own pleasure and the benefit of Zug and Dorf. Proud, glowing with his new status and the hearty congratulations of his new peers, noticed Vorn looking at him with unabashed admiration. Until that morning, Browd and Vorn had been equals, and Vorn had been his only male companion among the children of the clan since Goove had become a man. Browd remembered hanging around hunters just returned from the hunt as Vorn was doing. No more would he have to stand on the fringes ignored by the men as he eagerly watched them tell their stories. No more would he be subject to the commands of his mother and the other women calling him away to help with the chores. He was a hunter now. A man. His manhood status lacked only the final ceremony, and that would be part of the cave ceremony, which would make it especially memorable and lucky. When that happened, 
he would be the lowest-ranked male, but it mattered little to him. It would change. His place was foreordained. He was the son of the mate of the leader. Someday the mantle of leadership would fall to him. Vorn had been a pest sometimes, but now Browd could afford to be magnanimous. He walked over to the four-year-old boy, not unaware that Vorn's eyes lit up with eager anticipation when he saw the new hunter approaching. Vorn, I think you're old enough, Browd motioned a little pompously, trying to seem more manly. I will make a spear for you. It's time you began training to be a hunter. Vorn squirmed with delight, pure adulation shining out of his eyes as he looked up at the young man who had so recently gained the coveted status of hunter. Yes, he nodded in vigorous agreement. I'm old enough, Browd, the youngster motioned shyly. He gestured toward the stout shaft with the dark blood-stained point. Could I touch it? Browd laid the point of his spear on the ground in front of the boy. Vorn reached out a tentative finger and touched the dried blood of the huge bison that now lay on the ground in front of the cave. "'Were you scared, Browd?' he asked. "'Brun says all hunters are nervous on their first hunt,' Browd replied, not wanting to admit his fears. "'Vorn, there you are. I should have guessed. You're supposed to be helping Oga collect wood.' Aga said, seeing her son who had slipped away from the women and children. Vorn straggled after his mother, glancing back over his shoulder at his new idol. Brun had been watching the son of his mate with approval. It is a sign of a good leader, he thought, not to forget the boy just because he is still a child. Someday Vorn will be a hunter, and when Browd is leader, Vorn will remember a kindness shown to him as a child. Browd watched Vorn trail behind his mother, dragging his feet. Just the day before, Ebra had come for him to help with the chores, he remembered. He glanced at the women digging a pit and had an urge to sneak away so his mother wouldn't see him. But then he noticed Oga looking in, in his direction. My mother can't tell me what to do anymore. I'm not a child, I'm a man. She has to obey me now, Browd thought puffing up his chest a little. She does, doesn't she? And Oga is watching. Ebra, bring me a drink of water, he commanded imperiously, swaggering toward the woman. He half expected his mother to tell him to get wood. Technically, he wouldn't be a man until after his manhood ceremony. Ebra looked up at him, and her eyes filled with pride. That was her baby boy who had discharged his mission so effectively. Her son who had reached the exalted status of manhood. She jumped up, went to the pool near the cave, and returned quickly with water, glancing haughtily at the other women as if to say, Look at my son. Isn't he a fine man? Isn't he a brave hunter? His mother's alacrity and her look of pride eased his defensiveness and disposed him to favor her with a grunt of acknowledgment. Ebra's response pleased him almost as much as the demurely bowed head of Oga and the look of adoration he noticed as her eyes followed him when he turned to leave. Oga had been grief-stricken over the death of her mother, following so soon after the death of her mother's mate. As the only child of the pair, even though she was a girl, she had been dearly loved by both. Brun's mate was kind to her when she went to live with the leader's family, sitting with them when she ate and walking behind Ebra while they were searching for a cave. But Brun frightened her. He was more stern than her mother's mate had been. His responsibility lay heavily on his shoulders. Ebra's main concern was for Brun, and no one had much time for the orphaned girl while they were traveling. But Browd had seen her sitting alone, staring dejectedly into the fire one evening. Oga was overwhelmed with gratitude when the proud boy, almost a man, who had seldom paid attention to her before, sat down beside her and put an arm around her shoulder as she softly keened her grief. From that moment on, Oga lived with one desire. When she became a woman, she wanted to be given to Browd as his mate. The late afternoon sun was warm in the motionless air. Not the hint of a breeze stirred the least leaf. 
The expectant hush was disturbed only by the drone of flies taking their turn at the remains of the repast, and the sounds of the women digging a roasting pit. Ayla was sitting beside Isa as the medicine woman searched in her otter-skin pouch for the red bag. The child had been tagging behind her all day, but now there were certain rituals Isa had to perform with Mog Ur in preparation for the important role she had to play in the cave ceremony the next day, now that they were certain there would be one. She led the tow-headed girl toward the group of women excavating a deep hole not far from the cave mouth. It would be lined with rocks, with a large fire built inside that would burn all night. In the morning, the skinned and quartered bison, wrapped in leaves, would be lowered into the pit, covered with more leaves and a layer of soil, and left to cook in the stone oven until late afternoon. The excavation was a slow and tedious process. Pointed digging sticks were used to break up the soil that was scooped out by throwing handfuls on a leather cloak, which was hauled up out of the pit and dumped. But once the pit was dug, it could be used many times, only requiring an occasional cleaning out of ashes. While the women dug... Oga and Vorn, under the watchful eye of Uka's unmated daughter Ovra, were collecting wood and bringing stones up from the stream. As Isa approached holding the child's hand, the women stopped. "'I must see Mog-Ur,' Isa said with a gesture. Then she gave Ayla a little shove toward the group. Ayla started to follow Isa as she turned to go, but the woman shook her head and pushed her back toward the women, then hurriedly left. It was Ayla's first contact with anyone in the clan besides Isa and Kreb, and she felt lost and shy without Isa's comforting presence. She stood rooted to the spot, nervously staring at her feet, glancing up apprehensively now and then. Against all propriety, everyone stared at the thin, long-legged girl with the peculiar flat face and bulging forehead. They had all been curious about the child, but this was their first opportunity to get a close look at her. Ebra finally broke the spell. She can gather wood, the leader's mate indicated with an unspoken motion to Ovra, then started digging again. The young woman walked toward a patch of trees and fallen logs. Oga and Vorn could hardly tear themselves away. Ovra beckoned to the two children impatiently, then beckoned to Ayla as well. The girl thought she understood the gesture, but she wasn't sure what was expected of her. Ovra motioned again, then turned and headed for the trees. The two clan members who were closest to Ayla's age reluctantly trailed after Ovra. The girl watched them go, then took a few hesitant steps after them. When she reached the trees, Ayla stood around for a while watching Oga and Vorn pick up dried branches while Ovra hacked away at a good-sized fallen log with her stone hand axe. Oga, returning from depositing a load of wood near the pit, started dragging toward the wood pile a section of the log Ovra had detached. Ayla saw her struggling and walked over to help. She bent over to pick up the opposite end of the log, and as they both stood up, she looked into Oga's dark eyes. They stopped and stared at each other for a moment. The two girls were so different, yet so provocatively similar. Sprung from the same ancient seed, the progeny of their common ancestor took alternate roots, both leading to a richly developed, if dissimilar, intelligence. Both sapient, for a time both dominant, the gulf that separated them was not great but the subtle differences created a vastly different destiny. With each holding an end of the log, Ayla and Oga carried it to the pile of wood. As they walked back, side by side, the women stopped their work again and watched them go. The two girls were near the same height, though the taller was nearly twice the age of the other. One was slender, straight-limbed, fair-haired, the other stocky, bow-legged, darker. The women compared them, but the young girls, as with children everywhere, soon forgot their differences. Sharing made the task easier, and before the day was through they found ways to communicate and to add an element of play into the chore. That evening they sought each other out and sat together while they ate, enjoying the pleasure of company closer to their own size. 
Iza was happy to see that Oga was accepting Ayla, and waited until dark before she went to get the child for bed. They stared after each other as they parted, then Oga turned away and walked to her fur beside Ebra. The women and men still slept separately. Magur's prohibition would not be lifted until they moved into the cave. Iza's eyes were open with the first glimmer of early light. She lay still, listening to the melodious cacophony of birds chirping, warbling, twittering, and trilling in greeting to the new day. Soon, she was thinking, she would open her eyes to stone walls. She didn't mind sleeping outside as long as the weather was pleasant, but she looked forward to the security of walls. Her thoughts made her remember everything she had to do that day, and thinking about the cave ceremony with growing excitement, she quietly got up. Kreb was already awake. She wondered if he had slept at all. He was still sitting in the same place she left him in the night before, staring in contemplative silence at the fire. She started heating water, and by the time she brought him his morning tea of mint, alfalfa, and nettle leaves, Ayla was up and sitting beside the crippled man. Isa brought the child a breakfast of leftovers from the previous evening's meal. The men and women would not eat that day until the ritual feast. By late afternoon, delicious smells were drifting away from the several fires where food was cooking and pervading the area near the cave. Utensils and other cooking paraphernalia that had been salvaged from their former cave and carried in the bundles by the women had been unpacked. Finely made, tightly woven, waterproof baskets of subtle texture and design, created by slight alterations in weaving, were used to dip water from the pool and as cooking pots and containers. Wooden bowls were used in similar ways. Rib bones were stirrers. Large, flat pelvic bones were plates and platters along with thin sections of logs. Jaw and head bones were ladles, cups, and bowls. Birch bark glued together with balsam gum, some reinforced with a well-placed knot of sinew, was folded into shapes for many uses. In an animal hide, hung from a thong-lashed frame set over a fire, a savory broth bubbled careful watch was kept to make sure the liquid didn't boil down too far. As long as the level of boiling broth was above the level reached by the flames, it kept the temperature of the skin pot too low to burn. Ayla watched Uka stir up chunks of the meat and bone from the neck of the bison that were cooking with wild onion, salty colt's foot, and other herbs. Uka tasted it, then added peeled thistle stalks, mushrooms, lily buds and roots, watercress, milkweed buds, small immature yams, cranberries carried from the other cave, and wilted flowers from the previous day's growth of daylilies for thickening. The hard, fibrous old roots of cattails had been crushed and the fibers separated and removed. Dried blueberries they had carried with them and parched ground grains were added to the resulting starch that settled in the bottom of the baskets of cold water. Lumps of the flat, dark, unleavened bread were cooking on hot stones near the fire. Pigweed greens, lamb's quarter, young clover, and dandelion leaves seasoned with colt's foot were cooking in another pot, and a sauce of dried tart apples mixed with wild rose petals and a lucky find of honey steamed near another fire. Isa had been especially pleased when she saw Zug returning from a trip to the steppes with a clutch of ptarmigan. The low-flying, heavy birds, easily brought down with stones from the marksman's sling, were Kreb's favorite. Stuffed with herbs and edible greens that nested their own whole eggs and wrapped in wild grape leaves, the savory fowl were cooking in a smaller stone-lined pit. Hares and giant hamsters, skinned and skewered, were roasting over hot coals, and mounds of tiny, fresh wild strawberries glistened bright red in the sun. It was a feast worthy of the occasion. Ayla wasn't sure she could wait. She had been wandering aimlessly around the fringes of the cooking area all day. Both Isa and Kreb were off somewhere most of the time, and when Isa was around, she was busy. Oga, too, was busily working with the women preparing the feast, and no one had time or inclination to bother with the girl. After a few gruff words and not-so-gentle nudges from the harried women, she tried to stay out of the way. 
As the long shadows of the late afternoon sun lay across the red soil that fronted the cave, a hush of anticipation descended on the clan. Everyone gathered around the large pit in which the haunches of bison were cooking. Ebra and Uka began removing the warm soil from the top. They pulled back limp, scorched leaves and exposed the sacrificial beast in a cloud of mouth-watering steam. So tender it almost fell from the bones, the meat was carefully raised. To Ebra, as the leader's mate, fell the duty of carving and serving and her pride was obvious when she gave the first piece to her son. Browd evidenced no false modesty as he stepped forward to receive his due. After all the men were served, the women received their share, and then the children. Ayla was last, but there was more than enough for everyone, with leftovers to spare. The next hush that descended was the result of the hungry clan busily devouring their meal. It was a leisurely feast, with one person or another going back to pick at a bit more bison or a second helping of a favorite dish. The women had worked hard, but their reward was not only the comments from the satisfied clan. They would not have to cook again for a few days. They all rested afterward, getting ready for a long evening. When the lengthening shadows merged into the dull gray half-light of approaching darkness, the mood of the lazy afternoon subtly altered, became charged with expectation. At a glance from Brun, the women quickly cleared away the remains of the feast and took up places around an unlit fireplace at the mouth of the cave. The random look of the group belied the formality of their positions, the women stood in relation to each other according to their status. The men who gathered on the other side fell into a pattern according to their hierarchical place within the clan. But Magur was not in sight. Brun, closest to the front, signaled Grod, who stepped forward with slow dignity and from his oryx horn produced a glowing coal. It was the most important in the long line of coals that began with the fire lighted in the debris of the old cave. A continuation of that fire symbolized the continuation of the life of the clan. Lighting this fire at the entrance would lay claim to the cave, establish it as their place of residence. Controlled fire was a device of man, essential to life in a cold climate. Even smoke had beneficial properties. The smell alone evoked a feeling of safety and home. The smoke from the cave fire, filtering up through the cavern to the high vaulted ceiling, would find its way out through cracks and on drafts through the opening. It would take away with it any unseen forces that might be inimical to them, purge the cave, and permeate it with their essence, the essence of human. Lighting the fire was sufficient ritual to purify and lay claim to the cave, but certain other rituals were performed so often along with it, they were almost considered a part of the cave ceremony. One was familiarizing the spirits of their protective totems with their new home, usually done in private by Magur with an audience of men only. Women were allowed their own celebration, which gave Isa reason to make a special drink for the men. The successful hunt had already shown that their totems approved of the site, and the feast confirmed their intention to make it a permanent home, though the clan might be gone for extended periods at certain times. Totemic spirits traveled too, but as long as members of the clan had their amulets, their totems could track them from the cave and come when they were needed. Since the spirits would be present at the cave ceremony anyway, other ceremonies could be included, and often were. Any ceremony was enhanced by association with the establishment of a new home and, in turn, added to the clan's territorial bond. Though each kind of ceremony had its own traditional ritual which never changed, ceremonial occasions had different characters depending upon which rituals were conducted. Mog-Ur, usually in consultation with Brun, decided how the various parts would be put together to form the total celebration, but it was an organic thing that depended on how they felt. This one would include Browd's manhood ceremony, and one to name the totems of certain youngsters, 
since that needed to be done and they had a desire to please the spirits. Time was not an important factor. It would take as long as it took. But had they been harassed or in danger, simply lighting a fire would have made the cave theirs. With gravity befitting the importance of the task, Grodd kneeled down, put the glowing ember on the dry tinder, and began to blow. The clan leaned forward anxiously and expelled their breath in one communal sigh as flaming tongues licked the dry sticks in their first fatal taste. The fire took hold and, suddenly, appearing from nowhere, a frightful figure was seen standing so close to the bonfire its roaring flames seemed to envelop him in their mist. It had a bright red face surmounted by an eerie white skull that appeared to hang within the fire itself, unscathed by the leaping tendrils of lambent energy. Ayla didn't see the fiery apparition at first and gasped when she caught sight of it. She felt Isa squeeze her hand in reassurance. The child felt the vibrations of the dull thud of spear butts pounding the ground and jumped back when the newest hunter leapt to the area in front of the flames, just as Dorv beat a sharp tattoo in rhythmic counterpoint on a large wooden bowl-shaped instrument turned face down against a log. Browd crouched down and looked far into the distance, his hand shading his eyes from a non-existent sun as other hunters leapt up to join him in a reenactment of the bison hunt. So evocative was their skill at pantomime, polished by generations of communicating by gesture and signal, the intense emotion of the hunt was recreated. Even the five-year-old stranger was captivated by the impact of the drama. The women of the clan, perceptive of the fine nuances, were transported to the hot, dusty plains. They could feel the thundering hooves vibrating the earth, taste the choking dust, share the exultation of the kill. It was a rare privilege for them to be allowed this glimpse into the sacrosanct life of the hunters. From the first, Browd took command of the dance. It had been his kill, and it was his right. He could sense the empathetic emotions, feel the women quivering with fear, and he responded with more passionately intense dramatics. Browd was a consummate actor, and never more in his element than when he was at the center of attention. He played on the emotions of his audience, and the ecstatic shudder that passed through the women as he replayed his final thrust had an erotic quality. Magur, watching from behind the fire, was no less impressed. He often saw the men talk of hunting, but only during these infrequent ceremonies was he able to share the experience in anything close to its full range of excitement. The lad did well, the magician thought, moving around to the front of the fire. He earned his totem mark. Perhaps he deserves to swagger a little. The young man's final lunge brought him directly in front of the powerful man of magic as the dull, thudding rhythm and the excited staccato counterpoint ended with a flourish. The old magician and the young hunter stood facing each other. Magur knew how to play his role, too. The master of timing waited, letting the excitement of the hunt dance subside and a sense of expectancy rise. His hulking, lopsided figure, cloaked in a heavy bearskin, was silhouetted against the blazing fire. His ochre-reddened face was shadowed by his own frame, masking his features to an indefinable blur with the baleful, asymmetrical eye of a supernatural demon. The stillness of the night was disturbed only by the crackling fire, a soft wind soughing through the trees, and the whooping cackle of a hyena in the distance. Browd was panting and his eyes glittered, partly from the exertion of the dance, partly from the excitement and his pride, but more from a growing, disquieting fear. He knew what came next, and the longer it took, the more he fought to control a chill that wanted to be a tremble. It was time for Magur to carve his totem mark into his flesh. He hadn't let himself think about it, but now that the time had come, Browd found himself dreading more than the pain. The magician projected an aura that filled the young man with a much greater fear. He was treading on the threshold of the spirit world, 
the place that encompassed beings far more terrifying than gigantic bison. For all their size and strength, bison were at least solid, substantial creatures of the physical world, creatures that a man could come to grips with. But the invisible yet far more powerful forces that could make the very earth shake were another matter entirely. Browd was not the only one present who stifled a shudder as thoughts of the recently experienced earthquake suddenly imploded on their minds. Only holy men, Magurs, dared to face that insubstantial plane, and the superstitious young man wished this greatest of all Magurs would hurry and get it over with. As though in answer to Browd's silent plea, the magician lifted his arm and stared up at the crescent moon. Then, with smooth flowing motions, he began an impassioned appeal. But his audience was not the mesmerized watching clan. His eloquence was directed to the ethereal, though no less real, world of the spirits. And his motions were eloquent, using every subtle trick of posture, every nuance of gesture. The one-armed man had overcome his handicap to his own language. He was more expressive with his single arm than most men were with two. By the time he was through, the clan knew they were surrounded by the essence of their protective totems and a host of other unknown spirits, and Browd's chill became a shiver. Then quickly, with a suddenness that brought a gasp to a few lips, the magician whipped out a sharp stone knife from a fold of his wrap and held it high over his head. He brought the sharp tool down swiftly, plunging it toward Browd's chest. In a movement that was under absolute control, Magur stopped short of fatal penetration. Instead, with quick strokes, he carved two lines into the young man's flesh, both curved in the same direction and joined in a point like the great curved horn of a rhinoceros. Browd closed his eyes but didn't flinch as the knife pierced his skin. Blood welled to the surface and overflowed, spilling down his chest in red rivulets. Goove appeared at the magician's side, holding a bowl of salve made from the rendered fat of the bison mixed with antiseptic ashes from the wood of an ash tree. Magur smeared the black grease into the wound, stopping the flowing blood and assuring that a black scar would form. The mark announced to all who saw him that Browd was a man a man forever under the protection of the spirit of the formidable, unpredictable, woolly rhinoceros. The young man returned to his place, acutely conscious of the attention focused on him and thoroughly enjoying it, now that the worst was over. He was sure his bravery and hunting skill, his evocative performance during the dance, his unflinching acceptance of his totem mark, would be the subject of animated talk of both men and women for a long time. He thought it might become a legend, a story repeated many times during the long, cold winters that confined the clan to the cave and retold at clan gatherings. If it wasn't for me, this cave wouldn't be ours, he said to himself. If I hadn't killed the bison, we wouldn't be having a ceremony. We'd still be looking for a cave. Browd had begun to feel the new cave and the whole eventful occasion were entirely due to him. Ayla watched the ritual with fear and fascination, unable to suppress a shudder as the fearsome, hulking man stabbed Browd and drew blood. She hung back as Isa led her toward the frightening, bear-cloaked magician, wondering what he would do to her. Aga, with Ona in her arms, and Ika carrying Borg, were also approaching Mog Ur. Ayla was glad when both women lined up in front of Iza and herself. Goove now held a tightly woven basket dyed red from the many times it had been used to hold the sacred red ochre, ground to a fine powder and heated together with animal fat to make a richly colored paste. Mog Ur looked over the heads of the women standing in front of him at the sliver of moon overhead. He made gestures in the unspoken formal language, asking the spirits to gather close and observe the youngsters whose protective totems were to be revealed. Then, dipping a finger into the red paste, he drew a spiral on the hip of the male child, like the corkscrew tail of the wild pig. 
A low, gruff murmur rose from the clan as they made gestures commenting on the appropriateness of the totem. Spirit of Boar, the boy Borg is delivered into your protection. The magician's hand signals stated as he slipped a small pouch attached to a thong over the baby's head. Ika bowed her head in acquiescence, and the motion carried overtones that she was pleased. It was a strong, respectable spirit, and she felt the inherent rightness of the totem for her son. Then she stepped aside. The magician called upon the spirits again, and, reaching into the red basket held by Goove, he drew a circle on Ona's arm with the paste. Spirit of Owl his gestures proclaimed. The girl, Ona, is delivered into your protection. Then Magur put the amulet her mother had made around the infant's neck. Once more there was an undercurrent of grunts as hands flashed in comment on the strong totem that protected the girl. Aga was happy. Her daughter was well protected, and it meant the man she mated could not have a weak totem. She only hoped it wouldn't make it too difficult for her to have children. The group strained forward with interest as Aga moved aside and Isa reached down to lift Ayla in her arms. The girl was no longer frightened. She realized, now that she was closer, that the imposing figure with the red-stained face was none other than Kreb. There was a glow of warmth in his eye when he looked at her. To the clan's surprise, the magician's gestures were different when he called upon the spirits to attend this ritual. They were the gestures he used when he named a newborn child seven days after its birth. The strange girl was not only going to have her totem revealed, she was going to be adopted by the clan. Dipping his finger into the paste, Mog-Ur drew a line from the middle of her forehead, the place on people of the clan where the bony ridges overhanging their eyes met, to the tip of her small nose. The child's name is Ayla, he said, pronouncing her name slowly and carefully so both the clan and the spirits would understand. Isa turned to face the watching people. Ayla's adoption was as much a surprise to her as it was to the rest, and the girl could feel her rapidly beating heart. This must mean she is my daughter, my first child, she thought. Only a mother holds the infant when it is named and recognized as a member of the clan. Has it been seven days since I found her? I'm not sure. I'll have to ask Kreb, but I think it has. She must be my daughter. Who else can be her mother now? Each person filed past Isa, holding the five-year-old girl in her arms like a baby, and each repeated her name with varying degrees of accuracy. Then Isa turned back to face the magician. He looked up and called upon the spirits to gather once more. The clan waited expectantly. Magur was aware of their eager attention and used it to his advantage. With slow, deliberate movements, drawing out the moment to sustain the suspense, he scooped out a bit of the oily red paste and then painted one line directly over one of the healing claw marks on Ayla's leg. What can that mean? What totem is that? The watching clan was mystified. The holy man dipped into the red basket again and painted a second line over the next mark. The girl felt Isa begin to shake. None of the others moved. Not a breath could be heard. With the third line, Brun, with an angry scowl, tried to catch Magur's eye, but the magician evaded the look. When the fourth line was drawn, the clan knew, but they did not want to believe. It was, after all, the wrong leg. Magur turned his head and looked straight at Brun as he made the final gesture. Spirit of Cave Lion, the girl, Ayla, is delivered into your protection. 
The formalized movement removed the last shred of doubt. As Magur put the amulet around her neck, hands flew in shocked surprise. Could it really be true? Could a girl's totem be one of the strongest of male totems? The cave lion? Kreb's stare into the angry eyes of his brother was firm and uncompromising. For a moment, they were locked in a silent battle of wills. But Mogor knew that the logic of a cave lion totem for the girl was implacable, no matter how illogical it seemed for a female to have the protection of so powerful a spirit. Mogor had only emphasized what the cave lion himself had done. Brun had never questioned the revelations of his crippled brother before, but for some reason he felt tricked by the magician. He didn't like it, but he had to admit he had never seen a totem so obviously corroborated. He was the first to look away, but he wasn't happy. The idea of taking the strange child into the clan had been difficult enough, but this totem of hers was too much. It was irregular, unconventional. Brun didn't like anomalies in his well-ordered clan. He clamped his jaw shut with determination. There would be no further deviations. If the girl was to be a member of his clan, she would conform. Cave lion or no cave lion. Isa was stunned. Still holding the child in her arms, she lowered her head in acceptance. If Magur decreed it, it must be so. She knew Ayla's totem was strong, but a cave lion? The thought made her apprehensive. A female with the mightiest of cats for a totem? Now Izo was sure the girl would never mate. It reinforced her decision to teach Ayla healing magic so she would have some status of her own. Kreb had named her, recognized her, and revealed her totem while the medicine woman held her. If that didn't make the girl her daughter... What did? Birth itself was no guarantee of acceptance. Isa suddenly remembered that if everything continued to go well, she would find herself standing in front of the magician again before long, with a baby in her arms. She, who had been childless for so long, would soon have two. The clan was in an uproar, amazement in their gestures and voices. Self-consciously, Isa returned to her place amid the astonished glances of both women and men. They tried not to stare at her and the girl. It was discourteous to stare. But one man was more than staring. The look of hatred in Browd's eyes as he glowered at the small girl frightened Isa. She tried to place herself between the two to shield Ayla from the proud young man's malevolent glare. Browd could see he wasn't the center of attention. No one was talking about him anymore. Forgotten was his mighty deed that assured the cave was an acceptable home. Forgotten was his marvelous dance and his stoic courage when Magur carved his totem mark into his chest. The astringent antiseptic ointment hurt worse than the cut. It still stung. But was anyone noticing how bravely he bore the pain? No one was noticing him at all. The rites of passage for boys becoming men occurred with ordinary regularity, even for those destined to be leader. They didn't compare with the wonder and unexpectedness of Mogur's unprecedented revelation about the strange girl. Browd saw people recalling that she had been led to the cave first. They were saying that the ugly girl found their new home. So what if her totem is the cave lion? Browd thought petulantly. Did she kill the bison? This was supposed to be his night. He was supposed to be the center of attention. He was supposed to be the object of the clan's admiration and awe. But Ayla had stolen his thunder. He glowered at the strange girl. But when he noticed Isa running toward the camp beside the stream, his attention was drawn back to Magur. Soon, very soon, he would be allowed to participate in the secret rituals with the men. He didn't know what to expect. 
All he'd ever been told was that he would learn for the first time what memories really were. It was the final step that would make him a man. Beside the fireplace near the stream, Isa quickly removed her wrap and picked up a wooden bowl and red bag of dried roots she had set out. Stopping first to fill the bowl with water, she returned to the huge bonfire, soaring to brighter heights with the additional wood Grodd added. Isa's wrap had covered up part of the reason for her long absences earlier in the day. When the medicine woman stepped in front of the magician again, she was completely naked except for her amulet and the streaks of red painted on her body. A large circle accented the fullness of her stomach. Both breasts were circled too, with a streak drawn from the top of each over her shoulders and joining in a V at the small of her back. Red circles enclosed both cheeks of her buttocks. The enigmatic symbols, whose meaning was known only to Magur, were for her protection as well as the men's. It was dangerous to have a woman involved in religious rituals, but for this she was necessary. Isa was standing close to Magur, close enough to see beads of perspiration on his face from standing in front of the hot fire in his heavy bearskin. At an imperceptible signal from him, she held the bowl up and turned to face the clan. It was an ancient bowl, preserved for generations for use only during these special occasions. Some ancestral medicine woman had long and carefully chipped out the center and shaped the outside of a section of the trunk of a tree, then even longer lovingly rubbed the bowl smooth with gritty sand and a round stone. A final smoothing with the abrasive stalks of the scouring rush fern gave it a silky polished finish. The bowl was coated on the inside with a whitish patina from repeated use as the container for the ceremonial drink. Isa put the dried roots in her mouth and chewed them slowly, careful not to swallow any saliva as her large teeth and strong jaws began to break down the tough fibers. Finally, she spat the masticated pulp into the bowl of water and stirred the fluid until it turned a milky white. Only the medicine women of Isa's line knew the secret of the potent root. The plant was relatively rare, though not unknown, but the fresh root showed little evidence of its narcotic qualities. The root had been dried, aged for at least two years, and when hanging to dry, it had been suspended root down rather than top down, as was customary for most herbs. Though only a medicine woman was allowed to make the drink, by long-standing tradition, only men were allowed to drink it. There was an ancient legend, passed down from mother to daughter along with the esoteric instructions for concentrating the effective component of the plant into the root, that at one time, long ago, only women used the potent drug. The ceremony and rituals associated with its use were stolen by the men, and women were forbidden to use it, but the men could not steal the secret of its preparation. The medicine women who knew it were so reluctant to share the secret with anyone except their own offspring that it had been lost to all but the women who could claim a direct, unbroken line of descent into the depths of antiquity. Even now... The drink was never given without receiving something of like kind and value in return. When the drink was ready, Isa nodded her head and Goove stepped forward with a bowl of Datura tea prepared the way he usually did for the men, but this time for the women. With dignified formality, the bowls were exchanged. Then Magur led the way as the men retreated into the small cave. After they left... Isa took the datura around to each of the women. The medicine woman often used the same drug as an anesthetic, painkiller, or soporific, and she had a different preparation of the datura plant ready as a sedative for the children. The women could relax completely only if they knew their youngsters would not come seeking attention and yet would be safe. On the rare occasions when women allowed themselves the luxury of a ceremony, Isa made sure the children would be safe in the arms of sleep. Before long, the women began putting their drowsy children to bed, then returned to the fire. After tucking Ayla into her fur, 
Izo went to the overturned bowl Dorv had used during the hunt dance and began beating out a slow, steady rhythm, altering the tone by beating on the top with the stick, then closer to the rim. At first, the women sat unmoving. They were too accustomed to guarding their actions in the presence of men. But gradually, as the effects of the drug began to be felt, and with the knowledge that the men were out of sight, some of the women began to move to the stately rhythm. Ebra was the first to jump up. She danced with intricate steps in a circle around Isa, and as the medicine woman increased the tempo, it stirred the senses of more of the women. Soon they all joined the leader's mate. As the rhythm became faster and more complex, the normally docile women threw off their wraps and danced with movements that were unrestrained and frankly erotic. They didn't notice when Isa stopped and joined them herself. They were too involved with dancing to their own internal rhythms. Their pent-up emotions, so repressed in everyday life, were released in the uninhibited motion. Tensions drained in a catharsis of freedom, a catharsis that allowed them to accept their restricted existence. In a whirling, jumping, stomping frenzy, the women danced until, near dawn, they dropped, exhausted, and slept where they fell. With the first light of the new day, the men started leaving the cave. Stepping over the bodies of prostrate women, they found their sleeping places and soon drifted into dreamless slumber. The men's catharsis came from the emotional tension of the hunt. Their ceremony had a different dimension, more restrained, turned inward, much older, but no less exciting. As the sun broke over the ridge to the east, Kreb hobbled out of the cave and surveyed the scene littered with bodies. He had, on one rare occasion, watched the women's celebration out of curiosity. With a deep inner sense, the wise old magician understood their need for release. He knew the men always wondered what they did that left them in such a state of exhaustion, but Magur never enlightened them. The men would have been as shocked by the women's unrestrained abandon as the women would by their stoic mates' fervent supplications to the invisible spirits that shared their existence. Magur had wondered, occasionally, if he could direct the minds of women back to the beginnings. Their memories were different, but they had the same ability to recall ancient knowledge. Did they have racial memories? Could they join a ceremony with the men? Magur wondered, but he would never chance the ire of the spirits by attempting to find out. It would destroy the clan if a woman were included in such sacred ceremonies. Kreb shuffled to the campsite and eased himself down on his sleeping fur. He saw the disarray of fine blonde hair on Isa's fur and it set him to thinking about the events that had occurred since he had barely stumbled out in time before the old cave collapsed. How had this strange child charmed her way into his heart so quickly? He was disturbed by the undercurrent of bad feeling from Brun about her, and he hadn't missed Browd's evil looks in her direction. The dissension in the close-knit group marred the ceremony and left him a bit uneasy. Browd will not let it rest, Kreb thought. The woolly rhinoceros is a suitable totem for our future leader. Browd can be brave, but he's headstrong and too full of pride. One moment he's calm and rational, even gentle and kind. Then the next, for some insignificant reason, he can charge with fury in a blind rage. I hope he doesn't turn on the girl. Don't be stupid, he chided himself. The son of Brun's mate isn't going to let himself get upset over a girl. He's going to be leader. And besides, Brun would disapprove. Proud is a man now. He will learn to control his temper. The crippled old man lay down and realized how tired he was. Tension had gripped him since the earthquake, but he could relax now. The cave was theirs. Their totems were firmly established in their new home, and the clan could move in when they woke up. The tired magician yawned and stretched out, 
Then he closed his eye.